Ooh. Yay! James, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hey, can you invite me one more time? I'm gonna see if I can join from my computer. On your computer? Oh, you're on your you're on your phone now. We can we we can see you and and hear you clearly. Right on. All Sounds right. good. Wonderful. Peace and blessings, everyone. Good to see, good to see you all. It's Amina, and welcome to our IG live. It's unveiling love stories of community and social change. This is a space where artists and community leaders share their defining moments that shape their efforts in building community and safety and solidarity in a real way. This podcast is part of a Love Over Fear Oakland campaign organized by our family at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, defending the humanity of immigrants, defending the rights of the incarcerated, the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, works at an intersection of faith, spirituality, and social justice movement. This campaign is a response to challenges faced by communities of color in Oakland and we acknowledge the root causes that disrupt safety and community collaboration. So through this podcast, upcoming concerts, art exhibitions, we're here to nurture dialogue and connection between the Black, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Chicano community. Speaking about creating unity and solidarity, my favorite leader, one of my favorite leaders, Grace Lee Boggs, and she said, it is the time for us to reimagine everything. We have to reimagine revolution and get beyond just protest. My guest today is helping us to do just that. He is truly laying a foundation for us to create a new world of collaborative healing and liberation. He's the po uh, policy director of Justice Teams Network and the Anti-Police Terror Project, a Black-led, multiracial, intergenerational coalition that seeks to build uh, and eradicate, or actually build a replicable and sustainable model to eradicate police terror in communities of color. They connect impacted family and community members with resources and legal referrals. Also the president of the National Lawyers Guild of Bay Area, he is here to remind us that us as a community must be organized and we do not allow the state to set the terms for our resistance. Please welcome the amazing James Birch. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. I think I know you're so busy, so we appreciate your time. Um, ATPT, Anti-Terror Police Project was born out of a struggle for Oscar Grant. We had Kat Brooks here in an earlier episode and she shared with us her defining moment. You began your journey in 2007 at the uh, Southern Center for Human Rights where you investigated human rights conditions um, in Georgia and Alabama prisons. What was your defining moment that led you to, to this work? Uh, that's a great question. Um... I did after college, you know, I, I grew up in uh, Mass, so, so-called Massachusetts um, uh, and had a, uh, had, a, had a lot of educational opportunity growing up. I was like the scholarship kid, you know, my mom knew how to work the system and got me into what people think are good schools, um, like really traumatic, super colonial schools. Um, but they allowed me to, to, to move to a point where after college, I was able to go down to the deep south to Georgia and Alabama to investigate prisons and jails. And I was super naive at the time, super green. And so, you know, I thought we would uh, go into the jails and prisons, investigate the conditions, see all the terrible things that were happening, tell people about it and like, you know, either sue them or somehow things would be fixed. Um, obviously I was horribly wrong. Obviously I was uh, uh, naive and the turning point for me was, uh, going to jail after jail and prison after prison, seeing people living in worse conditions than I ever could have imagined uh, and having there be no recourse, uh, um, you know, the lack of organizing. Well, I didn't know what organizing power was at the time. I thought the law was the vehicle for change um, and uh, realized very quickly that it wasn't. You know, I thought 
so I said, okay, I thought that those folks were, were doing it wrong, and I thought if I went to law school, I could learn a better way to, you know, litigate our way to liberation, I guess is what I thought. It sounds silly now, but it's really what I thought at the time, right? You just need the right people to file the right lawsuits, and, you know, these prisons will be shut down. You know, that's, that's not how it works. Um, uh, I went to law school um, uh, and, and, and learned very quickly that's, that's not how it worked, and so... I graduated from law school three years later, really disillusioned and, 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 and clueless. Uh, and it wasn't until I came out to the Bay Area. Um, and uh, at the time, this is around 2014, 2015, um, the Frisco Five um, had started their hunger strike uh, to end the police murders in the city of Oakland or in the city of San Francisco. And so I didn't know what they were doing at the time. I learned now that they were, you know, mobilizing and organizing. Um, but I saw what they were doing and it, it felt like they were doing the right thing. And it felt like something that I should be doing uh, and should be leveraging all of my privileges and skills into supporting. And so that's really, that's really where I got my start and how I discovered to be um, uh, my place in the movement. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, the, the, to be able to be with the people and organize with the people, truly, that's where we build power. Um, but on top of that, we got to understand, we got to kind of get a little bit educated around this. And I feel like you will really kind of bring the math to really see this clearly. A report by APTP um, says that the Oakland Police Department reveals that it consumes almost 50% of the Oakland General Fund annually, yet we still do not feel safe. We do not feel like we have adequate protection. Why is that? And can you give us a little bit more more stats on this? Uh, uh, absolutely. You know, we you know the the defund movement um, really started here in Oakland in around twenty. You know, uh, soon after uh, I got to, to to APTP, right? You know, there's um, if you look on our social media and look back to the posts around that time, it was around the time of the murder of Yvette Henderson in Emeryville um, by the Emeryville Police Department and the murder of Mario Woods by the San Francisco Police Department, that, you know, we really started trying to think about how we could communicate differently uh, about police murder, right? There, uh, uh, you know, when you, you know, we live in a country that's indoctrinating children, you know, from the time they're, you know, one, two years old, you know, they're watching Paw Patrol and, 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 and TV shows that glorify cops. And so, you know, when years later, you know, decades later, they hear Black Lives Matter, it's hard for that to that message to undo decades of programming, right? And so as APTP, we're like, are there other ways that we can communicate about policing that might be, you know, uh, open the door to a real conversation? Because as you know, a lot of people's hearts and minds are closed to the concept that policing is, is a failed system uh, and, 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 and well, failed for us and, and, and violent by design for the colonizers and, and imperialists. And so, um, so how else do we talk about this, right? And we said, okay, you know, the other thing about policing that folks aren't talking about is, 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 is they're so strong and they have such a strong lobby, right? They have such a strong um, police officer association that, like, the, that elected officials are terrified of going against them, right? Because popular opinion, because if you're seen as weak on crime or, or not pro-cop, you know, you, 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 you lose uh, you lose the next election you're in. We've seen that across the country, especially in the backlash since 2020, right? And so we're like, okay, so how do we how do we commute? How do we get across to a bunch of people who should be on our side, right? Um, but aren't seeing the light, right? And so we thought about putting it through uh, a budget framework, right? Ivest in uh, Ivest invest divest is a framework as old as time, right? And so what happens if we attach that framework to policing? considering how much police cost, right? You know, like for, for, for example, in the city of Oakland right now, there are, there are, there are 35 officers that make $350,000 or more a year. Mm -hmm. And there are 90 officers making $300,000 uh, or more a year. And those numbers are from 2020 and they've gotten 3% raises each year since then. And so those numbers are undoubtedly significantly bigger than that, right? So what that means is for every cop on the streets, if you add their salary and their benefits, it's averaging us as a city about four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, let's be let's be generous. Let's say three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars per cop, right? And you start thinking about what cops do with their time, right? Which is a lot of 
um, a lot of nothing, you know, about two thirds of the time that uh, OPD is, is, is out responding to calls for service, they're responding to activities that are not crimes. I'm going to say that again, two thirds of the things they respond to are not crimes. They might respond to somebody calling for an ambulance. They might respond to uh, um, a, a noise complaint, which is not a crime. They might be responding to a suspicious person, which is not a crime. They might be uh, are responding in, in Oakland. They, they, they respond to some animal services calls. They respond to calls that there's an abandoned automobile, right? Well, we, we fixed that, but they did for a while. And so ultimately what you see is they're only spending about 5% of their time responding to what, as a society, we call violent crime, right? And another 10% of their time responding to what, as a society, we call property crime, right? And the rest of the time, they're, the rest of the time, uh, they're spending, um, the rest of the time, they're, they're spending, again, doing, responding to things that are, that are, that are not crimes, right? And so why is that? Right. And why is that when cops are costing us that much money that we're we're using them uh, uh, to, to, to as, a, as a catch all to respond to issues that are that are completely unrelated to, you know, what they're assigned to do. And again, the reason comes back to uh, as a society, we've decided um, that uh, if you're against cops, um, that you shouldn't be an elected official. Uh, and, and, and it kind of forbids any sort of rational discourse around policing or around what we're really doing when it comes to public safety. Mm. So, well, speaking of public safety, we're we're like midway through the budget cycle, right? And are we still the city council has, I believe, June thirtieth um, to approve the mid-year budget? Um, what can you explain to us and educate us a little bit? About what is the process when it comes to this? Okay, right on. So we're at the we're at the mid-cycle budget amendments right now. So Oakland has a two-year budget cycle, right? Every two years. Um, uh, the city passes its budget. And the way it does that is the mayor proposes a budget in about uh, February or March, right? And then the city council members from March until June will discuss that budget, will propose amendments, will you know have uh, disagreements about where the spending will go. But ultimately the city council votes upon and approves the budget. So it's ultimately the city council who are the uh, final decision makers, even though the mayor kind of sets sets the tone with the proposed budget that she puts out. Usually, usually she'll put out a budget and then the city council will maybe adjust it a little one way or another, but largely what the mayor is putting forward is, 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 is what becomes the budget, right? And so that happens every two years. And then uh, in the in-between years, we have the mid-cycle budget adjustments, right? Or, and, and what they're supposed to do at that time is um, look at the expenditures, you know, obviously everything you know, when we come up with our budget, there's a lot of projections, how much money we're going to receive via this tax or that tax, how much we're going to spend on X, Y, Z, you know, what our, what our, uh, what our vacancy rates are going to be in certain departments, right? There are a lot of, there's a lot of guesswork related in projecting a two-year budget. And so in the middle, after one year, we pause, look at the numbers, see if there's more money than we thought or less money than we thought, uh, and then make those adjustments, right? And this year, uh, we had a lot less money than we thought, right? Following uh, uh, several years where the federal gov government gave us um, COVID relief dollars under the American Rescue Plan Act, people call ARPA, um, we were receiving, you know, 100 and uh, well over 100, I don't have, fortunately I don't have the number in front of me, I believe it was like about $150 million um, annually for, 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 for several years, right? We don't receive that money anymore. And so it's not a surprise when they, came up with our budget projections for this year, um, when we came to mid-cycle adjustments, they realized that we were $177 million, well, what became $155 million short of where we thought we were going to be. So we had a $150 million hole to cover, and that's the conversation that we're having right now, and the decisions about that conversation will most likely be made. They have, they have a soft deadline of the 30th, but the decisions will most likely be made on the 18th next week. We had a conversation about it at city council, um, yesterday, and one of the major pieces that that everyone's talking about is that there's a decision to sell um, the rights to, to that that the Oakland has to the Oakland Coliseum to a uh, a black um, sporting group called AASEG for a hundred million dollars. And so, as opposed to being 155 million dollars in the hole, which you know would have 
really negatively affected the city in, in, in profound ways. There's only a $55 million hole, which is terrible, uh, and is leading to a ton of cuts, um, but, but won't, but isn't as bad as it could have been. I, I, I tend to get a little wordy about things when it comes to budget. I hope that was a clear explanation, but I'm happy if there's any questions about that. Yes, yes. Yes, for anyone who have questions, please, uh, for James, please type in the comment section. Um, what are the priorities the, the mayor should prioritize? What is your, your vision for Oakland? Okay, so, so one of the things, you know, the primary thing that APTP has been talking about for the last 10 years um, is that, you know, there's a, we're in a real budget crisis here in the city of Oakland and have been. Right, you know, uh, uh, while we pass a budget every year, where where um, that's 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 balanced with our revenues and expenditures, you know, behind the scenes, we're hundreds of millions of dollars behind in paying for our pensions. So we have unfunded pension liabilities that are that are that are worth uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And so every year we should be paying into those pensions so it doesn't come to a point where we're supposed to pay pensions and we don't have the money to pay them, right? That's a huge problem, right? But, you know, every year there seems to be some urgent crisis that means that we need to spend all our money or X or Y or Z and, and we don't ultimately pay into those, to that pet liability the way that we should be, mm. right? We, what we know as APTP is whether you love uh, police or like us, you, you hate cops, um, uh, there is no way that we can afford to continue to pay a police force of the size and cost that we have um, and meaningfully address the budget crisis, that, the, the, the pension, the liability crisis that we're in, right? So if we want to pay, be able to pay retired workers moving forward, we really need to, uh, we really need to address this crisis and start thinking about how we're going to do things differently. And so that, that's where we're trying, you know, so, so that's a real conversation that even if you, even if you're like, we need police, right? We can't pay for the number we have now. What are you going to do? Mm. What are you going to do? And so as APTP, we're like, yo, there's common, there's common ground here, right? Again, there's, there's two thirds of the calls that police are responding to are for non crimes, right? What we call crimes, right? Again, the word is, you know, but, 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 but using their definition. So why wouldn't we just have other people respond to those? City workers, DPW, Parks and Rec, community ambassadors, right? Macro, right? Programs where people who are trained to care and support folks go out and do their job, right? That would save the city millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? And start the process of writing the ship because we could start l decreasing the number of cops we have. Because again, not only do these cops cost us the 200, you know, the 300 to $500,000 per year that they make, then they have pensions, right? And very good ones. I think it's they get to get an average of the last three years of total pay that they receive, you know, that to, to calculate their pension. So then we're paying them forever more. And, and 80% of these cops or more don't live in Oakland. So it's not like the taxes on their income are coming back to the city. The taxes are going out to Pleasanton or, or, or Dublin or, 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 or somewhere else. And so the city isn't getting anything from this, right? Except some cops who are doing a whole bunch of nothing. You broke that down, James. You broke. I mean, we hear a lot of things that you know happen, and we see on, you know, on the news or what we see in the community. But the numbers, the math, and you really breaking that down really um, allows us to see this clearly. We have, um, I think, a question saying that um, from Roderick Noble: Are you saying that we have no way to limit the amounts that these police officers are making because they're too powerful with their union? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, in, in many places, yes, right, right. There's a, there's a there's a lot of conversation going across the movement on how we really need to do public education and base building, right. So we need to be going deep into our communities and making a lot. You know, it is a privilege to be able to spend my time organizing and fighting for freedom, right. Uh, 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 a lot of folks have, you know, two jobs, three jobs, you know, so many kids facing eviction, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving from place to place, no permit. You know, how are they supposed to um, um, keep up with these conversations? How are they supposed to participate meaningfully in the movement? That's on us, right? That's on us, right? We have to, we have to get this education out to the people. We need to reach people where they're at, right? And make sure that they get 
the information they need and the space they need to be empowered to make whatever decisions they want to make. Yes. Right. And so as APTP really trying to figure out how this isn't just something that we're talking about in some nonprofit circles or at some, you know, uh, uh, um, or, or some events that's, you know, the same people that we're seeing every week. Right. Where are the people who have no idea that APTP exists yes. and how do we get to them? Right. And that's really what we're working on right, right now. It's providing that type of access. And where are the who are the dope groups doing work deep, deep, deep in the city or, 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 or supporting very, very marginalized groups, right? Who who if they had this type of education, they could do some real they could do some real real things, right? But they're so busy, you know, focused on mutual aid and uh um it's like supporting like we support of a, a lot of unhoused communities in the city of Oakland. Right. And folks are 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 so busy trying to stave off um, um, uh, evictions and the harm and death that come from them, um, that they, you know, that having a proactive campaign where we're talking about these issues and, 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 and providing the research is a challenge. Right? And, and, and we're getting better as a movement at doing that. Uh, and, you know, that um, um, I've, I'm hearing across many spaces uh, a return to a focus on that. Let's stop jawing at the state, right? And let's start speaking to our communities so uh, we have a more collective power. Absolutely. We, there's one more question on how do we get, how do we even get that information out there, like how much these officers are making? Do you think that will help if we would share that information of how much they're making? Uh, and we basically could do that. Uh, definitely. You know, we try to, um, uh, we try to, we try to make it not boring. Boring. I don't even want to say exciting because it is budget stuff. Um, but we're trying to make these numbers accessible, right? You know, we're we're where are we going to meet the people? Where you know the people are here? They're on Instagram. They're on TikTok, right? They're on you know they're not um, they're not reading our blog posts on our website. They're not you know reading the local news. So how do you make this information? You know, and we're competing with the amazing content creators who are on these apps, right? And so if I'm, I'm trying to reach you know, uh, um, you know, folks from 18 to 24, um, and I'm competing with all the other things they're seeing when they scroll, what's going to make the thing I have pop out, right? And so, and so leveraging, um, um, uh, uh, you know, infographics or, 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 you know, making sure um, that our policy team and our comms team are in sync when they're coming up with graphics. You know, I'm the policy guy, I'll, you know, you hear the way I'm talking now, the, the things I'm saying don't fit on a graphic, or if you do, it's just going to be lines of text because, you know, I want everyone to see every word. Our comms team is like, no, nah, man, you got, you got, you know, you have 10 words, right? right? You have 10 words, or you have, you know, one, you know, one fact to leave people with. And so how do you make this hit? We had a graphic that really popped off a couple of years ago that just listed how much one of the most expensive cops in Oakland made, right? And that is picture, and that is face, and it said, you know, his name is I'll leave his name. No, his name is Malcolm Miller. I don't know where he is right now, but in, in like 2021, he was making, you know, he was, the, he was the cop who assigned people to overtime on special projects, and he assigned himself the most overtime, so he made the most money. Um, uh, and, 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 and we just put out a graphic that just had his stats on it. Mm -hmm. Or like I said, if we put out a graphic that just says there are, you know, 35 cops that make over $350,000 and 90 cops that make over $300,000, you know, that information we got from a very boring website. It's from transparentcalifornia.com. Mm -hmm. And it lists all the salaries of all the public employees. And so we went there and we looked for OPD and we counted up the number that were over 30, you know, 350. You know, we counted up to see what numbers would be, what, what numbers we thought would uh, be something the public would be interested in. Um, um, and that's what we came up with. But it really, it, it, it's a great question because that's the biggest challenge is how do you get people to, care or we're like we'll be presenting at town up tuesdays right or at the juneteenth celebration and everyone's like you know get in turn right mm -hmm. they don't you know they're like having a good time they're focused on their joy they're not like you know that's not the most the space for 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 aptp militancy right but but is there a, a a little flyer i can leave them with is there a fact i can leave them with there's a Q, qr code they can swipe is there something i can do to gain access to their um, to their headspace uh, in a way that feels good for them is something we're always thinking about. Right, right. So, all the artists, creatives, using imagination, like we all gotta really kind of come and connect. You know, it's collective learning, 
collective collaboration. Um, you believe in creating spaces that are conducive to thr to thriving, you know, not just surviving. What are some programs that are out there that is helping to, to create this space and how can we support that? Can we, um, are we able to find that on your website, like these programs? That's a, there's a, there's a couple things going on. I think that it's, that it's, uh, um, that that has me thinking about, um, we're working on a really, you know, and, and especially in light of the things that you're saying, we're working on a really, uh, incredible mural, um, with, um, uh, freedom archives, the Palestinian youth movement. Um, I don't have the whole list of organizations that are involved, but it's trying to create a space that links together the fight for Palestinian liberation uh, um, and the um, a fight for liberation here um, on Ohlone territory and so-called Turtle uh, or on Turtle Island. And so um, the uh, the links between the two, um, um, they're having different groups collaborate on those graphics together. And so, uh, like you said, pursuing these opportunities to create art that inspires us to think differently has a real impact, especially on the on, on the youth. Um, um, not only in you know not not necessarily not, not not only when 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 visualizing the art, but I, but I'm speaking specifically about the students and the and the youth who are participating in the creation of this mural hearing their ideas, hearing their view of what it means to be oppressed by the state reflected in art, um, is, it just seems like an invaluable process for these kids. And so uh, I'm really excited that organizations like Courage and, 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 and I believe uh, Urban Peace Movement have been engaging this process uh, um, um, in, in, in exposing their youth um, to, the, um, to, uh, to, to like the combined international struggle that we're fighting for, you know, we, and then and then when you ask your question, my mind stays with, um, you know, it's almost like you can go, go to any department and think about a, a life affirming program. Like it's one of the good ones to talk about is libraries, right? Because unfortunately, since our society is so um, brutal and violent to the unhoused, a lot of unhoused folks um, uh, use libraries as a resource. And so it's like, okay, if this has become like our, one of our communal meeting spaces, if this is a place, that, a safe space for folks, let's flood it with resources, That's right? right? Let's, uh, what, if there's a, what if there were just an on-call therapist, right? A social worker, uh, if there were programming, if there were uh, um, um, folks who could teach, you know, who ran a daily class on how to get connected to, to city services, right? You know how like, you know, for those folks who work for people who are unhoused, it is so hard to figure out how to get identification to be able to, to apply for services when you have none like you see everything stolen you don't have an id you don't have a birth or you don't have anything mm -hmm. and you're trying to tell people this is who i am so i can get my id so i can establish my address so i can get attached to services right it's like it's so it's so unfair and everything is such a tremendous hurdle right that thinking about places where we can you know again this isn't this is this is this is this is a common common idea right it's like you know it's, 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 it's you find it commonly in the housing first model where we're we're we're, 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 we're for providing housing for people who are unhoused or who are um need supportive services put those services right by the housing right have housing have service providers always there so if anyone needs services they don't need to get on two buses and go across town to go get a pink slip to carry two more buses somewhere off, you know and then they didn't have the money for the bus so they get arrested on the way or cited and then they have you know it's just it's you know it is already such a tremendous challenge you know just to be unhoused that like that that that, that you know again providing these services in libraries is 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 makes makes a makes a profound difference and so you can you can do that across the board you could you know same with parks and rec there are parks and rec programs where they train people who are um servicing the parks who are cleaning the parks right with with um a set of soft skills to be able to support people who might be pre-crisis right right you know because so so you identify someone who looks like they're dehydrated you identify someone who looks like you know they need a mental health support you can right this is these are training courses we can provide people mm. to take you know what is like a a job that fits one category and also allow it to support people who who because of our like macro failings as a society are always you know on the edge of crisis right right 
you know, talking about mental health and crisis, I'm based here in Los Angeles. And I recently um, went to a community rally, Justice for Yong Yang. It's a 40-year-old Korean man who was shot and killed by the LAPD um, in the middle, middle of a mental health crisis. Uh, less than 10 seconds when police came to the door, he was shot and killed. And so for, for those uh, out there, you know, if you want to learn more, it's, um, Instagram is uh, at Justice for Yong Yang. So it made me think about MH First which is a project of anti-police terror project, right? It's a cutting edge new model for non-police response to mental health crisis. We need more models like this. How did that come about? And how can we have that over here in, in, in Los Angeles? Uh, right on. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's similarly to, to uh, the story you just shared. Um, it comes out of the, countless families that we've supported or you know with so many deaths happening for deaths that we've heard of um uh of folks who were in mental health crisis who were killed by the police right and so you know you know stephen taylor uh miles hall uh kayla moore um uh angelo quinto um there is there is an there is a a, a frighteningly long, long list um of folks just off the top of our head from the work that we do of folks just in the just in the just in the bay area um just in the last few years right who have been killed during mental health crises um and so that is that, that's like that's at the core of the mental health first project and that's you know what spurs on the work is okay we need to, you know, and you can see this in a lot of our work, we need to decrease police contacts as much as we can, mm. right? And so what ways can we, using all of our brain power, figure out to do that? Sometimes it's making up programs like Mental Health First, right? Or establishing, in the city of Oakland, we have the macro program now, which is a city-run program through the fire department that's supposed to send, that does send um, a peer support worker and an EMT if folks are kind of pre-crisis. Pre Right, a lot of work to do to make that program what we want it to, to be. You know, we also need drop-in centers and places, places to bring people. You can't just have you know vans running around trying to stabilize folks. There need to be a place for them to go so they can you know achieve medium and long-term stability, right? But but these are um, um, these are the problems that we we're trying to make solutions to. When when we came up with with MH first is how do we not have how do we approach a person with compassion and care as opposed to a badge and a gun right and so you know always in the movement it's you know the best way to do this is to just make it ourselves and establish those principles because anytime the state or or or, or you know like the the nonprofit industrial complex gets involved everything gets watered down um and so what is that first thing that we're going to build and then you know again we're this is it's not reserved to the to the mental health space we're doing this in the active transportation space as well right Police pulling people over is the primary way that police have contact with black and brown folks. How do we reduce those police contacts? How do we get police to stop pulling people over, right? Do we prohibit them from pulling people over by removing certain code infractions, like, you know, making it so hanging a air freshener from your mirror isn't the reason why cops can pull you over anymore, or, you know, making it so you can, they, can, they can't pull you over if you have a broken taillight or things like that? Um, or is it fixing our roads uh, and making our roads safer so uh, by design so that speeding is less of a problem, right? There are plenty of ways you can make roads safe without, and one of the worst ways you can, you can, you can enforce road safety is by having a police officer pulling people over, right? That's not, but, but if, you, if you spend several million dollars fixing up a roadway, putting in roundabouts, putting in speed bumps, then the number of deaths and in, in harms go down uh, uh, dramatically. And so... You know, that's what we're on about, right? And every, again, in every area, you're going to talk about libraries, parks and rec. In every single area, cops have crept in and are occupying so much space. And, and, and then worse, and to make matters worse, we're paying more than any other, anyone else to have them occupy that space, right? Instead of a librarian making a good librarian salary, we have a cop making some ridiculous, you know, uh, uh, half a million, you know, $400,000 salary, right, across the board. And so, the you know, the, as I said in the beginning, with you know, we can't just go to city council and ask them to make these changes, right? That's not how it works. 
We have to, you know, we have to power build. We have to do public education. Everyone needs to know about these problems uh, and feel like they're empowered to change the, the, the result. Yes, you know, we, we see the student protests on campus against the genocide in Palestine. We see how the police is responding to the students. We hear a long list of folks that were killed in mental health crises, and it's the people of all diverse backgrounds and ethnicity, people of color, right? How important is building racial solidarity, like bringing all the folks together? And how can we do that? How, how can we like cultivate and nurture connections between the Black, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, the Chicano, the Indigenous? How can we come together? It's a big question. Um, uh, and I've been heartened by the, the energy that I've seen um, in the direction of international solidarity recently, right? Again, you know, I'm kind of like a broken record, right? You know, a lot of things come back to public education to me, mm. right? You know, as long as my struggle is my struggle and your struggle is your struggle, and I don't really know about your struggle because I'm just so focused on my struggle, how am I going to draw the connections that allow me to see the inter, how, inter, how closely intertwined and interrelated they are, right? And so, you know, when you, when you see how, for instance, um, the uh, uh, Irish elected officials are communicating about the genocide in Palestine right now, they're clear on what this is and what it looks like because they've experienced it themselves. And as someone who's experienced it, they're always looking as a nation to support other folks who are going through that type of situation or a similar trauma. Right, again, we saw that similarly with, with South Africa initiating the, the ICJ proceedings, right? You know, as experiencing an apartheid, you know, being keenly aware of what that looks like, right? And being keenly aware of what international attention and support can do to shift the, the, the tide of a genocide uh, as, you know, as, or, or and as the, uh, of an apartheid state as happened in South Africa. Um, you see, you know, you see the focus who have gone through this um, in the most difficult ways, the most clear on their solidarity, right? And for, for, for other groups who might not um, be as clear, again, it's up to, it's up to, it's up to, it's up to, to political education, right? And so, and so as, 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 a, as a Black organizer, and, uh, you know, we're going around telling everyone there's no Black liberation without Palestinian liberation, mm -hmm. right? And, and making sure that folks understand that those aren't just words, that's real. Like the you know to 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 dare to envision a world where black people are truly free, but Palestine is still you know a, a, the Palestinians are still oppressed. That's that you know if people really think about that, they'll start to understand that 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 world it can't possibly exist, right? Right. If if black people are going to be liberated, right? Uh, uh, Palestinians must be liberated, right? Um, um, and folks across the globe uh, uh, must be liberated. And so. Um, you know, the incredible, incredible organizing that the Palestinians have done, uh, um, you know, for years and particularly, you know, in this moment um, has done that for a lot of groups, right? And for a lot of folks, right? A lot of folks are continuing to show up, you know, where we're, we're, we're months and months in, you know, it's, you know, again, we're talking about last year, we'll come up on a year soon, right? And, and, and folks are still out in the streets, we were out in the streets, you know, two days ago, and we'll be back out on the streets this weekend. And it's not just us, it's not just the Palestinians, it's folks from across different groups. And so, you know, and then, and, and then critically in this moment, you know, you know, watching our Palestinian comrades lift up uh, the genocides in, 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 in the Congo and the Sudan, lifting up uh, uh, the genocidal violence in, 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 in Haiti, um, shows is giving clear guidance to the rest of the, you know, to the rest of us on how we do this, right? Even if your struggle is the focus, take, you know, um, uh, and, and should be the focus, right? How do we always think about how this will, how, how, we, how we will build upon this moment moving forward, right? Always maintaining not only a vision of how we respond to this moment, 
but like looking forward, you know, in some cultures they talk about looking forward seven generations, you know, for myself, to be frank, just being able to look forward, you know, a, a decade, you know, uh, in the struggle and how we're able to, you know, to, to build is, 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 is really what, how I challenge myself to show up. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. So, you know, here at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, we, we believe in, you know, cultural traditions and faith practices to um, help us heal and also help us maintain our well-being to continue this work like you and I. What are your cultural or faith practices that, or beliefs that help you uh, and, and help your well-being while doing this work? Because this work can be, can be quite heavy. Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, that is definitely a challenge. Um, it's definitely a challenge for me. Um, right now, I know that I'm leaning most into my kids. Mm. Um, I have a, a two year old and a four year old, um, and they're little movement babies. And so they, you know, uh, show up at rallies. They'll chant with us. They'll rock with us. You know, they've they've encouraged us to always think about how we can make movement spaces more accessible. Right. We work with like for instance. Since we work with families for ceasefire right now to make sure that there's any, you know, if there's any events, right, there's so many families who want to come, but how do they, you know, how do we make it, you know, how do we have their kids not, you know, playing in the, uh, in the corner in San Francisco in a pile of, you know, concrete, you know, how do we give them something to do that is, that is um, uh, both in alignment with what we're doing as the movement, empowering for them, uh, and also just respects that their kids want to have fun and, you know, get very cranky at, at, at 6 p.m. if we're still rallying. Right. Um, and so, and so that's, what's kept me really going is, is, you know, I have, I have two kids who, um, um, who will be around. Um, and so I want to leave the world in a better place than, than I received it. Um, and so, um, grounding myself in that drive, um, has been really helpful for me, um, as a, as a, as a, as a somewhat new parent and really reinvigorating in terms of, 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 of how to engage in the movement. Beautiful. And it's like Father, Father's Day is a couple of days away, I believe. So happy Father's Day. And I pray that you have some time to, you know, enjoy with family and, and, and rest. Um, so any you guys have questions for James, this is the time to type it in the comment section. Um, as we're approaching the last few moments of the IG Live, I always ask this question to every one of my guests. If we were to come to a public presentation and what love looks like. We're unveiling the face of love. In this moment, with everything that you went through, your path and your journey, if we took off the veil, what does love look like to you right now? What must it have? Oh, uh, love, man, uh, I'm so focused on the ability of, of, for each and every person to thrive. Um, you know, and so when you ask that question, you think of an unveiling, I think of something, you know, just like a lot of color and light and joy um, for people, um, for, for all oppressed people. Um, and so, you know, that's, for me, uh, it's my love for, for my people and kind of like how you said earlier, you know, through my lens of, of, of my fight and my love for black people, um, you know, being able to extend that love to all people and to fight for all people who I like, uh, fight for all oppressed people the way I fight for black people um, is, is how I, has how I challenge my heart space uh, and how I, uh, uh, it's, you know, when I'm, when I'm doing well, um, like emotionally and spiritually, that's where I am. And that's the challenge that, you know, that, that, uh, that I'm moving forward in. And, and, and then for me, I'm always grounded in um, my love uh of of my people uh and my belief that we deserve uh, the ability to thrive you know i'm a person who um grew up uh one of four kids and and the rest of the family did not have the opportunity to thrive and so every day of my life I'm, i see through a lens of what i've been afforded and the opportunities i've had uh and just the the you know uh marathon of 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 difficulties obstacles uh uh trauma and tragedies that my my siblings have endured uh, and and the uh, how unfair it feels has always burned inside me, um, and so and and and, me, and and provides me with like a burning love and desire for them that I'm allowed to that I'm fortunate enough to be able to expand to all people, right? You know the, what's what's going on for my brothers, going on for 
for so many people of all walks. And so that's, that's what I try to embody as we move, uh, as we move through this movement. Beautiful. Beautiful. I think, you know, for myself as a Chinese Muslim, my faith is very much part of uh, fighting for liberation for all, you know, as a daughter of immigrants, I had to, I struggled through, you know, who am I, right? Um, not really feeling like I belong in a lot of spaces, um, but I love my people. I love um, who I am as a Chinese woman, but uh, that pride of being Chinese extent, like that love extends to all people that are oppressed. And I find that common, that commonality, that humanity um, of it all. Thank you so much for your time, James. I truly appreciate how you broke everything down for us and educate us in such a powerful, powerful way. We need to learn the math. So please, I hope that we can be in these collective spaces to learn, to learn um, in all different ways. Let's read some of the comments. What unique reflections can you share have your kids brought to light to quality of care people deserve in entirety for the human race? Wow. That's a question. James, uh, my, right? my, 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 my oldest one, um, after going to do some uh, eviction defense in an encampment, told us that it, it was too sad um, and they couldn't do it anymore. Um, and, and so that grounds me in how profoundly sad how we treat um, people who are forced to sleep outside is, um, and that you know that's something that I've, I, you know, that I've always been fighting for and always known. But just there, uh, just the how clear they, they were immediately um, sticks with me. It's a great question. Yeah. And Roderick says, "Just want to say thank you, much gratitude, James. Thank you so much again for being here. I pray that you have a safe and blessed." Day. Sam says, thank you for this genuine dialogue to the both of you. Thank you. Right on. Appreciate you, Amina. I appreciate it. Give my love to Cat Brooks, please. It's done. All right. Have a blessed day. I'll see everyone next time. Right on. Thanks, everybody. Bye.